You, you know, I've listened to your music for such a long time, like the other quartet that's 20 years ago or more, actually, even. And, uh, you know, yeah, it's it was something, you know, I always loved Dave Douglas's trio with Brad Shepik. And this was like this next version in my ears because it added, you know, Ohat. And, uh, but, uh, you know, I, I wanted to ask you since you moved to the Midwest now and, uh, what's it like for you musically what's i mean obviously new york is a totally different vibe but like especially for your creativity i mean i listen to headlands which i love by the way and i want to ask you about that one as well but uh you know what's changed for you creativity wise and composing wise or like all this musical yeah it's it's it. it's interesting i mean they're great musicians everywhere in the world as you know I mean, yeah. like literally everywhere in the world they're incredible musicians and chicago has a is a fantastic scene and so i i live in milwaukee but it's only 90 minutes to chicago so like i mm. play friday saturday and i'm driving down after we're done here to play tonight too so um yeah it's the difference to me is about depth Mm, okay really. i mean there are there are incredible musicians incredible musicians who i'm really fortunate to play with and and i was i was fortunate i've been here now in milwaukee for uh 11 years 11 and oh, a half already years. wow okay yeah which is crazy time flies man oh. um, and i i was able to step into some really great projects shortly after get moving here so that kind of like eased my transition but uh yeah i i don't think it's really changed much i mean it's like anywhere you find your community especially as yeah. a composer or a band leader you find your community and then you write for those those players right so um in that way it's just been kind of a logical extension of everything that i've been doing for my whole career mm -hmm. um a different different set of players obviously yeah. a different you know set of strengths and weaknesses but um weaknesses man none of them are weak nobody's weak <laughs> a different set of strengths or 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 taste or whatever yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. so for me it's been it's been i mean it's been fantastic and and there are a bunch of you know like i have a new band um that i've i just recorded in november because uh mark feldman the that's with mark and tim daisy and yeah mark, oh, tim shit. Daisy yeah, i wanted to ask about really, that yeah yeah and a really great young bass player ethan fillion so yeah, I mean, when I heard that Mark was moving to Chicago, I was like, okay, I guess I got to start a band with Mark. <laughs> you know? Of course. Um, so it's, I mean, it's, it's like I said, it's almost been like a logical extension of what I was doing in New York. The difference between New York and everywhere else is in New York there are a hundred great name your favorite instrumentalists, yeah. right? You know, and it's just it's just a matter of 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 depth. Like here, and I've always kind of been this way. I if I don't have subs in my bands very often, you know, I work with the players, I write for the sure. players that I want. And if they can't do the gig, I don't do the gig basically. Mm -hmm. So, you know, where in New York, you can kind of get away with that maybe more, but there's, like I said, there's just so many incredible musicians in Chicago. And, and uh, you know, I live 90 minutes from Chicago. I teach at a university that's only an hour from Chicago. So it's, it's, it's like an easy commute for me. And that's, and when I left New York, it was 2011, August, 2011, when I left New York, like Chicago was the big draw because I, you know, I, I am fortunate to have a teaching p position at the University mm. of Wisconsin Parkside in Kenosha. Um, and it was one of those things where I didn't necessarily want to move anywhere. I wasn't looking to leave New York. <laughs> um, but when the job came up, I, I you know, I, yeah. I, I know the history of the Chicago musicians and, and I knew I'd be able to find some incredibly creative and badass musicians. So, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, just aesthetic wise of course and that's why i wanted to ask you you know like quality wise of course it's just like you know the, i always associated like the last 20 years chicago scene more with a free avant-garde-ish more oriented mm -hmm. like that that's at least the players who are coming to europe are more from that scene you know that that's what i meant so like well, even sure. dave frampis i know you played with him now and yeah we're playing daisy as well yeah oh really yeah. okay yeah <laughs> you know these guys yeah. are more yeah. Yeah, they're more in the, in the, into the, the yeah. you know, free scene or whatever word you want to use, improvised yeah, yeah, music. Exactly. Yeah. And I've always loved that music. 
Mm. So it's that's why when I said logical extension, like the first, my first real gig in Chicago, um, I, I'm I'm sure you're familiar with Jason Stein, the bass sure, clarinetist. Yeah, sure. He's incredible. Um, it was literally the night he was playing on a Sunday at the Chicago Jazz Festival, and um, his the saxophone player in his band got really ill, like got pneumonia the night before. So he called me at like nine o'clock at night and was like hey can you learn my music and play the festival tomorrow oh. right and so like and that was kind of like my introduction to the scene but like i you know so i started a band with jason and tim um and yeah so it you know and i love that music so i you know it, 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 going back to your first question yeah it did i guess it did change maybe my compositional my way of, of composing music because i was trying to write for those guys yeah. so i was trying to, yeah know, um, really great bass player Anton Hatwich was in that band, so it was Stein, Anton Hatwich, and, and Tim Daisy. And so, like, yeah, I mean, I, I try to write for their strengths. So, yeah, I get you know to get back to your first question. Maybe I should have thought more about that. But yeah, it did. You know, it, I don't want to say forced me; it allowed me to go into a yeah, more open, yeah, yeah. allowed me to yeah, yeah, open area of music. Uh, you mentioned like the new one with Mark Feldman. Coming out. When is it going to be released, and where? Like, I think, I think. Well, there's. A, I mean, I can't really discuss. There, there's a, a okay, new label sure. coming out in Chicago. Oh, ah, okay, okay, cool, cool. I haven't, I haven't signed it. it it'll be this fall. Early, okay. I think early this fall, like maybe end of August, September. Oh, okay, um, fantastic. Yeah. So yeah, we just recorded in November, and and uh, and you know, as with most of my projects, we did the record in five hours. Um, sure. <laughs> I mean, you know, people work different ways, and it's it's fantastic. But for most of my things, the way I like to approach music, um, and me as a recording person who's recording one or two takes is all I have in me. So, um, yeah, but I'm super happy with it. And and That's like we played the Chicago Jazz Festival last summer, and uh, we did a bunch of touring, and and yeah, and so and 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 I hope to get that band on the road in Europe, like early oh, yeah. we beautiful, yeah, twenty twenty four. I guess I'm, I mean we're 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 trying to nail down some dates, but. Hopefully early 2024. Yeah. Fantastic. Beautiful. Yeah, it's a nice combo. You know what I've heard on, on YouTube, like violin and trumpet. That that's man. I don't know a single other project no. that is cordless. Yeah. That has that lineup. Or yeah. or just that lineup. I guess actually Dave did had a band with with Dave did with and, yeah, yeah, with, with Eric Friedlander. Friedlander and yeah. Green and, yeah. and Dresser, if memory serves. Right? Dresser, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So yeah, I mean it's it's not completely unique, I guess, but but yeah, I don't I don't know of a quartet. No, me either. Yeah, with trumpet and violin, and and again, it's it goes back to the idea of oh, here's this incredible musician, I want to play with him. So yeah, <laughs> you know, it wasn't like I was looking to to you know create that particular particular you know instrumentation for an ensemble. It was like oh, cool, he's here. Let's try and and, and make something yeah. happen with him. So oh, beautiful. Well, yeah. yeah. When you said you composed music, like. You know, when I listen to your records, like even like I mentioned Headlands already, like there's always this idea of melody. Uh, you know, there's one tune you wrote, I, I think you wrote it like Fjord on that one. Fjord, yeah, yeah. I love that melody. You you know, it's so beautiful. But then on the other hand, you go this into this knotted lines, which kind of angular stuff. And like, what's your approach when composing? And uh, you know, do, do are you like a guy who sits down daily, writes a sketch, or do you like actually say, okay, I'm going to write a ballad now? Or... I wish I were the guy that wrote daily. I would love okay. to be that. I would love to be that person. I I am very much a project by project basis. So with most of them, with Headlands and with the new project with yeah. with Feltman, like both those were circumstance related. So Hyde Park Jazz Festival, an incredible festival on the south side of Chicago. Uh, the woman, Kate Dumbleton, who was curating that, asked me to do a new project for her festival. And so that's when the idea of Headlands came up. Mm, and I've been okay. playing, and, and, and the bass player in that is Matt Euler, who's an yeah. incredible composer. Yeah, he's yeah. fantastic. Yeah. yeah, and so, and I've been playing in, in his projects, and, and so I, was, I wanted to do something with him. So, I, yeah, I very much wrote for that festival and then when mark got here i wrote because mark was here so i'm not somebody who that sits down and writes every day i wish i were that guy um but in some ways i think that's also a strength because uh, when yeah. i'm composing i'm composing for this group for this 
project for right now. And, you know, with hopes, you know, if, if we all like where the material is going, that a record happens and, 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 you know, the path that follows after that. But I'm, yeah, I'm, I'm somebody that, um, and, and getting back to that, that tune Fjord, um, I love beautiful melodies, man. Yeah, man. <laughs> you know, and, 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 I mean, we all have, I guess, our our self perceived strengths and weaknesses, and and, yeah. and one of my strengths, I think, is I can deliver a melody. So, um, you know, and I love all the angular stuff, and 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 I love sound and texture and all these different things. But um, one thing I've been trying to do compositionally is is not dismiss ideas that I think are simple or beautiful. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because I went through a period where I did that where I'd have something that I thought was strong, but I wouldn't use it because I was like, oh, this is too easy or whatever, which is just so dumb. But I was in, you know, that's the place I was in. So, um, so I've, I've really, you know, I try and, and, and um, what, whatever comes, I like, I don't yeah. sit down and try and write a ballad, right? You know, I mean, that was me sitting at the piano in which I play very poorly, but I do use it for composing. Um, yeah, that was me sitting down at the piano and playing a couple of intervallic things. And then, you know, everything else kind of comes out of it. So, um, and like one thing, like with the Headlands record, like I, that is actually, it's a it's through Compose Suite. Like mm -hmm. it, it drives me nuts when people listen to it on Spotify or whatever, because it's like, you know, um, that it is literally a 55 minute piece of music. That's one live gig. That's like yeah. the whole record is one live gig. Um, and, and the only reason there are track markings are because I needed that for the record, sure. right? Yeah. So it's like a through compose 50, 55 minute piece of music. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, getting back to the compositional thing, uh, I love a lot of different musics, uh, you know, um, I have friends that are amazing composers, um, you know, and, and I try and, and take what I hear around me and then try and get it to, I guess, come out through my lens, you know, for yeah. lack of a better word, but, I, but I'm not somebody that, you know, um, sits down and, and writes every day. And, and I, as I said earlier, I wish I were, but I also think that is a strength in a way that, because when I do sit down to write, there's a definite focus for what I'm, what I'm doing. And yeah. then it's agonizing. And I, and I, you know, I'm, you know, fretting over every single note I put on the page. <laughs> yeah. But the secret would... to that is having great players, right? You get yeah. great players, you can put some couple of dots on the page and they make it sound fantastic. So yeah. I rely I, heavily on that. Oh man, that's true. No, but <laughs> you, you wrote beautiful music and, you know, have written it. So it's, but it, it's true what you said, you know, like the, this, the simplicity, like last year I really fell into uh, Paul Motion again. And, you know, I went through his songbook and I was just like, man, you know, it's like a six bar melody. And I, I was like, Damn, I wrote a bunch of music, just like, you know, a G and E minor chord with ninths in the melody. That's it. And I'm like, it works, you know, it's like. And I'm sure it's killing. Yeah. And it's like it, no 7 4, no 11 0 or something. It's just like, man. And, and that's, that's what you said, that's, you know. Well, we often, uh, you know, especially once you see, see uh, get to a certain level of proficiency, if we want to call it that, we kind of expect to do those things. And motion is the perfect, because I saw that trio mm. 40 times, 50 sure. times. I mean, like every time they were. They were the vanguard which was always i'd be i'd be there you know and 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 you know that was yeah that was a band that really changed my life you know so yeah. and and he's obviously the master at writing those and i'm using quotes simple yeah, yeah. you know melodies but they're anything but i mean they're really and, and to play music in that world is both terrifying and thrilling yeah yeah well, it's quite liberating just to play an interval and yeah. let it ring like I was like man you guys do the rest if you have a good drummer or you know, a saxophone or you know or that's, it's just like oh. as we said we get good musicians yeah 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 <laughs> you know when when you know you the first thing you mentioned was was the other quartet with ohad and yeah. and um i mean that band i guess you would say it was a direct thing coming kind of out of day but also out of the paul motion trio stuff you know baseless quartet yeah. and um and that that band was you know we were really fortunate that was late 90s early 2000s and we were on knitting factory records and and that was a big deal at that time it was a big deal to be associated with a knit and to be yeah. on a label was like a really you know it was a 
fed on our cap or whatever, whatever you, phrase you want to say. Um, and so we were really, really fortunate to be a part of that scene at that time. We're re really lucky. Yeah. yeah. The, 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 you mentioned the trio. I, I mean, I want to come to the other quartet still, but you mentioned the trio, you know, okay, great. Lovano and Frizzell and Motion and that they really inspired mm -hmm. you. Like, if we go even further back, like, I don't know, early 80s or something, <laughs> you know, or even earlier, what got you excited for jazz and improvisation? What were those records or moments or live gigs? I uh, I, I owe a debt of gratitude to Adam Nussbaum. Really, I was I was at a I was I was 16 years old. I was at a jazz camp. I grew up in the Midwest. I was at a jazz camp in Illinois, and I was sitting in Jamie Abrasold's record store, and there were thousands of LPs. This is 1979, or whatever. Some no, maybe 80, 81, some somewhere. In there. And um, Adam Nussbaum came up to me. He's like, "Hey, kid, what do you play?" And I was like, I "Play the trumpet." And he's like, "You have to have these four records." And it was working, steaming, cooking, and relaxing. Miles, oh, Quintet, wow. you know, first Miles Quintet. And literally, I got home, I put those records on, and my life was changed. I was like, I want to do that. I mean, I was already playing the trumpet, and I was kind of dabbling in jazz. But when I heard those records, I was like, yeah. I am in on whatever that is. I want to do that. So like that was like the early the early mm -hmm. thing. And then, you know, like in my late teens, I was way into Woody Shaw. And that's where some of the angular stuff comes in. Like that, yeah. you know, my Miles and 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 Woody were like my guys. You know, and then later on I went through a Freddie Hubbard thing and a Kenny Doran yeah. thing and, and all these other incredible musicians, including peers and people that are younger than me. Um, but uh yeah, that was like my gateway into it was was the first Miles Quintet. And I, and I, you know, I knew Coltrane's name. <laughs> um, and, and so I was like, I'm going to buy these Coltrane records because I hear he's really good. And they were the live in Stockholm sessions with Dolphy from like 61. Yeah. I, I could not get in on that, man. That was That's way heavy. over yeah. my head. That's heavy. The Miles thing, I could get the, 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 the Coltrane with Dolphy thing. That just was like, I was not ready for that material. And then later on, of course, I yeah, yeah. You, you did love that. it. But so that was really like my my entrance my entrance into it, and and I had I had a, a, a an older brother who played trumpet and he had he had kind of blue, um and sketches of Spain along with mm. Record Brothers Heavy Metal Bebop and Chick Corea Light all those seventies you know yeah <laughs> those seventies important records my brother had a few of those so uh, you know that was kind of like my way in but but those Miles Quintet records I'm you know I I just I wore them out and that was my I got to do that moment you know that's a beautiful start yeah I mean. Miles is for so many of us. Like, I guess it's it's more apprehend, more easy. I mean, easy. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like to, to grasp and yeah. Definitely. Yeah, and 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 obviously his entire career. And I mean, I still listen. To, I still probably listen to Miles more than any other single musician. If I had to calculate, I don't you know stream music very often, but um, if I had to calculate my hours spent listening now, I probably still listen to you know i mean it's different different eras of his music and stuff like that but yeah but it, it was yeah. it was it was the sound right it yeah. was the yeah. sound i mean that you know the sound it sounded like his harmony it was right in my ear and it's yeah. the sound of those records and it was just like it was so beautiful and i was like man that's that's it for me yeah it works every time i, I listen to kind of blue today and it's like it sounds corny because it's kind of blue but it's still man it's it, it's such a good record it's really a good record right it's, the first it's, quarter notes when they play so what yeah and the miles plays that little break in the first four quarter notes and that and, and when they start this it's just like i get i'm, I, I'm the hair standing up yeah. on my arms thinking about it how swinging that is yeah it's, it's, it's killing incredible music. it doesn't matter how many times you experience it it's still magical yeah 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 the, after this miles experience i mean uh, i've read you st studied at berkeley briefly right yeah like how, yeah. how did you and decide to do that and uh... it was um so i grew up uh in racine wisconsin and my parents didn't have a ton of money um and i went to the school i teach at now strangely enough for a year oh, well. you know okay. wisconsin parkside and i saved that i was working a job i was working third shift in a grocery store from 10 p.m to 6 a.m three nights oh. a week saving money and then going to class at eight o'clock for theory or whatever and i was saving my money so that i could go to berkeley and i only i was only there for a year but 
um, and this is a person that you might like kind of hear in my playing. Um, I studied with some great teachers, but the guy that really um, blew my mind was was not on the trumpet faculty. He was he was on the faculty, and he was before he was famous, and that was Tim Hagens. Mm, okay. Tim, yeah, Tim was teaching ear training and, and and ensembles and things like that, and I had had a record he was on. Like I said, the angular thing really appealed to me. I was into Woody, and I'd heard this. Yeah. I don't know how I got I, I got a hold of this record, but um, and it was uh it was called "Because They Can" by uh, Bert Seeger. It was Hagen's and Garzone. They're playing another. There will never be another. You changes, and I transcribed Tim's solo on it, and I went up to him and I was like, you know, I I, I think I know what you're supposed to play on an F seven, and I don't know how these notes work, you know. <laughs> And he was like, man, I've never seen my shit written out before. <laughs> this, this is 1984. Right? Yeah. And, and this is before Tim was like incredibly well known. And, and so he just like, he was like, and I was like, you know, I, I love your playing. And he's like, well, let's get together. And so I, and, and like, the, that was my first semester that I was there. And the second semester, I signed up for every elective that I could that Tim was teaching. Well, and there was another okay. guy named Bill Mobley there. So I yeah, was getting sure. more, and, and my trumpet teachers were great too, but I was, I signed up for classes with, you know, the guys whose music that I was really into and like, and, and Tim, I mean, he's to this day, I mean, he's, I've, I heard him. A yeah. He's a monster. Yeah. Him. Jesus. He sounds better than ever too. I mean, it's just yeah. like continuously growing. So like Tim was really important to me. Um, he was important for me getting over some of my uh, hangups. <laughs> yeah you know he was like well what do you want to work on in my first lesson he's like what do you want to work on he didn't charge me he was super kind and gracious yeah. and i was like well i can't play double time i can't play fast and he was like okay play a g and i was like okay play a g. he's like <laughs> he's like wiggle your fingers i stop i mean what do you mean wiggle my fingers <laughs> he's like play a g and when I tell you, you wiggle your fingers. So I'm playing a G and then he's like, wiggle your fingers. So I wiggle my fingers and I'm playing. So you, see, you can play fast. <laughs> but it was what, it was like literally one of the most important lessons moments I ever had because it was like, oh, okay, cool. I, I, I may not have context for all this, but sure, I'm able to do this. I can wiggle my fingers and, and now I'm playing fast. So, and that was, it was much deeper than that, but that was like the first sure. lesson. And I was just like, oh you know like this this is amazing so yeah tim was very yeah i went to i went to berkeley and i was only there for a year i didn't have any money and i couldn't i couldn't afford to stay but it was uh it was yeah it was a fantastic and there were so many incredible musicians there that you know i used to play basketball with <laughs> uh, as well as play music with um uh, but yeah that was that was it was a really great year um and like i said tim was really really kind of Mm, it really wasn't okay. kind of he was really important for me yeah yeah, yeah. The, the, now when i think about it yeah there is there is that angular of tim in you a little bit i guess yeah or, for sure yeah definitely well yeah that didn't connect it didn't think of tim actually I mean, yeah but yeah and that that's a good thing yeah yeah that's a good thing yeah sure <laughs> but uh, how did you when did you move to new york actually a couple of years later um, I moved there in 88, uh, summer of 88. Um, and like most musicians, especially trumpet players, um, I did a lot of, um, Latin gigs, uh, salsa and cumbia bands. And I knew mm, nothing okay. about that music. I knew nothing about the music at all. Like nothing. I'm a white boy from Racine, Wisconsin. I knew nothing about that. <laughs> music. Um, but I could play the trumpet a little bit. <laughs> So, you know, one of the guy, one of the trumpet players took me under his wing and was like, yeah, you, you don't, you don't know anything, but you can play. So we'll make, we'll make this work, <laughs> you know? So yeah, I moved there in 88 and, oh, right. you know, I, and I did what a lot of players do. I mean, I wasn't like a prodigy. I didn't like go there with, you know, like everybody wasn't waiting for me to arrive, <laughs> you know? Um, some people, you know, you, you know, New York opens its doors for you right away. I was definitely not one of those those players because I had a lot of work to do personally, you know. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, I moved there in '88 and I and I hustled. I did everything. I did some Broadway shows and stuff. I did nice. some European tours of shows. I did a salsa and cumbia bands. I did some club dates, and I was and I was practicing all the time and and playing and and 
you know, playing some jazz gigs, going to sessions, going to the jam sessions, wherever they were back then, it was the angry squire and the blue note and all that. Yeah, stuff. Yeah. I would go to, I would go to those sessions get my ass kicked and then yeah. go home and say, Oh, I guess I got to learn stable mates. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So that, that was it. And then I, you know, it took me like many, it took like a decade of being in New York before I, I started to find my way. Um, and that was, it, it was really interesting. Like, um, Curtis Folks, the great trombone player. Mm -hmm. um, I did the Big Apple Circus with Curtis. So Ralph Alessi was in the band before me, and then oh. Ralph left, and I took over for Ralph. It was wow. Curtis Folks and an incredible saxophone player named Sam Furness, who was yeah. on the, the Julius Hemphill sax, sextet records and stuff like that. And Sam was like kind of this, you know, legendary guy. So the horn section, and Kermit Driscoll was in the band. The wow, band. It's like, that's beautiful. It's the circus. It's a kill. It's New York, man. It's a killing band, right? And so, like, I played with Sam and, and Curtis hundreds of shows a year for a couple of years. And, like, my I guess my big break was Curtis asked me to be in his band. Oh, so, wow. Okay. Yeah, That's that beautiful. was like, that was like, the, and, and, and I mean, this is 95, 96, something like that. And it, I think we recorded in 97 or 98. And that was, like, my first record. And, I, I mean, I, I, I remember, and it was a CD, but I remember, like, I couldn't believe it. Like, man, I'm on a, you know, it's today's, today's world is a little different. Anybody. Yeah. Yeah. But it's, and, and, and that was, it wasn't the case when, you know, and so like, I, I like Curtis and Curtis hooked me up with a bunch of incredible musicians. Like through him, I met a lot of, uh, you know, people, especially in that New York scene, the down, the downtown yeah, scene in yeah. New York and the knitting factory scene and stuff like that. And then, you know, as I was meeting those people, I was hanging out there all the time. And that's when my, you know, my, path shifted as far as who and what i wanted to be as a musician mm -hmm. okay yeah interesting yeah, because the first records i have you are on are around 2000 so that, that's yeah. why i wanted to ask you you know what was happening in the 90s okay so what you answered yeah. now so yeah yeah it was yeah. it was that and then and then the other quartet and, and yeah. well i went i went to manhattan school of music i guess it was 90 five i did two stints there because i had i I'd said i dropped out of berkeley i'd never finished my undergraduate degree so i went back and I was 30 when I went back to school to finish my undergrad at Manhattan. And I met, it, Ohad and I met like right away. His first ah, person. that's where you met Ohad, okay. Yeah. And, and and so we put a band together like the first couple of weeks of him being there. And that was the other quartet. So, um, yeah. Oh my God. I can't believe this. This has time left. Is that on me at my end? Or you no, no, no. It's it's cool. Uh, we, we, we basically log in on the same link then after. Uh, right, I'll, right. I'll let you know. Okay, cool. It's me. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. Okay. So, yeah. Oh, Ohad. Um, Oh, had I created this band and, 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 and that was really, it was, it, I, I talked about it earlier. It was, it was incredible. I mean, the music was complex the music. Of the yeah, other quartet yeah. was really complex and, and we weren't, we were never reading any, I mean, after a while we were playing a lot in the knitting factory back in those days. And this, this was really like what was the launching point for me is the knitting factory had, I mean, there were four rooms, yeah. um, uh, and and I played at the old one on Houston Street too. I'm old enough to remember that. Uh, but uh, the the um in the what they called the tap bar, they would have every music from eleven to three every night, oh. and people would have a steady gig. And you know through Curtis and 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 then with the other quartet, we had a steady gig where we workshopped this music, which was incredible. I mean yeah. to have that was amazing. Um and so yeah, I mean we you know. It, that that was like my that was the first band i was a part of that i started really writing for i'd written some tunes before that but it wasn't like um i, I don't want to say it wasn't serious it was serious but it wasn't with a project in mind so yeah, yeah the band with ohad um it was originally a guitarist named uh, jim hirschman but then pete mccann joined the band yeah and it was uh, the original band had mike serene on drums and then ferber mark ferber joined the band like uh, you know and and i mean they're all incredible musicians yeah it's killing and, yeah yeah, and and like we we actually we played now it's probably like five years ago after not playing for like a whatever twelve fourteen years and it was like we never left man and and I still had all the music memorized because wow <laughs> it was, you know it was it, it's uh, it's rare that as you know that we get to the spot where we get we get to do that play that much with one group and yeah. have you know have that experience of like oh this music's complex but I know it <laughs> you know. 
It was awesome. It was fantastic. Yeah. Wow, that's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, I love that band. I don't know. It's like I said, you know, it has like you know this downtown edgy something, and you know, you and Ohat also like are so beautiful together. How how you play? It's like Thank this, you. you know, go in somehow. It really does, and we just recorded a couple of weeks ago, a month ago. Really? Um, yeah, he's. I, mean, I don't know if the word is out, but he has this trio um, with uh, Tordi, uh, Chris Tordini and Eric McPherson, where they're playing this these uh, Ornette Coleman compositions that um, are are unrecorded. And so, uh, yeah, I just I was just in New York a couple of weeks ago with him, a month ago. Uh, recording a couple of tunes well actually oh, a bunch of tunes for the for his new thing oh. it's, it's kind of interesting like yeah it's really it's it's tordini and mcpherson uh leo genovese on, on on mostly synth some piano but mostly synth wow. and electronics and then ohad shane ensley and myself Whoa. Um, so it's kind of yeah it's it, it, and i mean the session was fantastic it should be fun you know so yeah right. i mean ohad ohad was was uh, you know he and he really was the the guy that would was um forcing me in a way to write he was like mm -hmm. yeah if we're gonna do this you got to bring in tunes i was like okay i guess <laughs> all right yeah yeah so and, and and as i said earlier that was such a special time and i've you know um i'm very thankful that i was part of that scene at that time it was it was remarkable yeah it was something was happening in new york then i think those for sure the downtown late 90s early 90s kind of this vibe all these bands and it's just like man everything you listen to i mean i listen to now it's like whoa it sounds still so fresh nowadays yeah, even and I mean, you know yeah. which is rare sometimes with music but even now you put it on it's like man it's contemporary it's now like there was there was a vibe cool. to that music and those musicians yeah. and those musicians you know all went on to do a lot of great things you know um yeah, and, and you know, you could go down there and hear them and sit in the tap bar for free and listen to great music. <laughs> you know? yeah, I mean, I was hanging out there all the time, all the time, you know. And that yeah. that just like I and one quick story, I remember hearing uh Tim Burton's blood count there. Ooh. And they were playing in the old office and they were playing five nights. And I went the first night and I was like, Okay, I'm gonna go back tomorrow. I went the second night and I was like, Oh, okay. And I had a gig the third night, but then I went back the fourth and fifth night. And by the time I got to the fifth night, I was like, that was again, one of those moments where my life changed. I was like, I didn't know you could put music together like that and have it come out like that. It was like, it was, it was, it totally changed my perspective of, of, of what music could be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Those bands burned it like big Satan. And that uh, also for me, like, of course, man, man that's, that's, that's yeah crazy stuff like his compositions like just goes on and this thing's happening like yeah yeah That's i'm, crazy I'm stuff. constantly uh um enthralled with his music yeah me too yeah sure Tim is amazing yeah like uh the, the, we mentioned oh did, did oh also then kind of lead you to lee konitz and the steve swallow yeah. connections yeah for sure he was he was the connection with with those two and um you know, and I'm obviously thankful for that. And, you know, Oha and I are super tight. I was the best man in his wedding. Um, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, I mean, he was he was really instrumental in, in getting me involved in those projects. And um, and those were, um, man, such an honor to play with those mm. those musicians and to play that music. Yeah, and exactly. supposedly there's, um, well, I know there is a recording that I think is going to come out of the Swallow Sextet music. Um that we recorded live at the jazz standard oh wow beautiful that is that is i mean i've heard a couple of the takes and it's really strong so i'm hoping it comes out <laughs> oh man beautiful <laughs> yeah so ohad was like he got me connected with with those guys and and yeah and i'm super thankful for that that was that was you know mid uh, 2000 like yeah. four to 2009 10 something like that yeah yeah, it's beautiful. Like, uh, how was it? Like, how was Lee like? I mean, to you younger guys back then. I, I'll I'll tell you a, a quick Lee story. Well, I mean, Lee Lee could be the nicest guy or the biggest curmudgeon you've ever met. Yeah, of course. Sure yeah. Everybody, yeah, sure. everybody who will attest, right? Um, I'll tell you one another one of those singular moments that changed my life was 
we were I was playing with Lee at the Jazz Standard with the Nanette with Oha. Mm-hmm. And um we got we were on a set break and Lee and I are walking into the back room and he's like, Russ, why are you playing all those eighth notes? No one wants to hear that. <laughs> I love that. That's so cool. And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know. Um <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'm playing too many eighth notes. I'm like, Lee, you play a lot of eighth notes too, man. <laughs> I, I didn't say that, obviously. Sure. But, but it was, it was, he wanted me to improvise. He wanted me. And, and, and there's another, like the first, mm. the first tour that I did was a sextet, was with, with Ohad and Lee. And I'll, I'll never forget this. We were at a rest stop in, in France and it was my first, like the end of the first tour. And I mean, I was shaking in my boots playing next to one of the legends, you know, and, and, I got up the stones to ask him. We we're in a truck stop in, in France, and I said, Mr. Konitz, what do you think of my playing? <laughs> oh, shit. And, and, he, and he said, this is great. And I wish I could remember. I could, it would, the story would be better if I could remember. He's like, well, maybe I shouldn't name names. Um, I'll name the name that he, he he's like. You like Chet Baker? I was like, man, I love Chet Baker. And then he named another player, modern player, who's fantastic. And then a third player who's great. And and um and he was like, and the conversation was like fifteen seconds is long. Fifteen seconds long. He was like, Chet Baker has a thing. You got to get a thing. <laughs> That's so cool. <laughs> it was it was amazing. And like and I have recordings of that. Actually, I actually Ohad released one on Bandcamp of that that sextet from like I don't know ninety eight or something like that. Mm, oh, yeah. I have to find it. Okay. It's yeah, and and like I'm like man, I feel like I'm starting to develop my thing. I feel like, you know, but Lee was really like that. That was that was a moment where I was like, oh, okay, you're right. I mean, and, and it was is is you could take that as a positive or negative, right? Sure. Um, and I took it as a positive. Um, and I was like, okay, it was in some ways it was really like um, affirming that I was on the way to something, to finding my path, right? Yeah. You know, I, yeah. to my finding my thing in his words, you know, Chet Baker that's, has a thing. So you cool. got to get a thing. That's so cool. Yeah, was- I mean, when I look at your discography and uh, the records I have you on, like this early 2000s were huge for you. Like, I think you probably toured really a lot, played a lot. And then you did like Save Big also, which is your debut, right? And I love that record, like the tunes and the band is, you know, I'm one of the biggest fans of John O'Gallagher. I mean, I played with him and recorded with him, but... He was Again. the best man in my wedding. <laughs> ah, wow. Okay. So, yeah. but like, how yeah. did you decide to do Save Big and that band, and you know, how did that happen? Um, well, thank you for the the kind words. Um, John and I met at Berkeley the year that I was at Berkeley, and oh, okay. I, as I said, like I was way into Woody Shaw, and I heard him practicing, and and it was like when you first get there they make you do these, they, uh, an audition basically where they give you ratings. And so I was doing my audition and I was playing and John was hanging out outside, like the saxophones were in the, like across the He's like, hey man, you sound like Woody. <laughs> I was like, Thanks man, <laughs> you know? And so like John and I, like we, we bonded instantly, like instantly. And it, when, I, when I moved to New York in 88, John was like, he was already there and, and I had sublet an apartment for two months with the intention of just spending two months in, in July and August in, in, in New York. And John was like, man, you can't leave. You got to stay. You can't leave. And I was like, you're right. So John and I would play on the street. We would play in central park. We would just oh, like, little, you know, duo, you know? Um, so, and, and I mean, as you know, there are musicians you have a hookup with and, and John and I had that we played together a lot. And, mm. um, and besides being an incredible human being, he's, as you I mean, I, I say this all the time when, when I talk about John, there's nobody that's better than he is. You might like other people, yeah. but they're not, yes. they're not better. You can't, you can't convince me that they're better than John is because he does everything you could ever possibly do on that instrument and is, is yeah. Yeah. yeah he's, he's, he's one of the most underrated players there out there that like. Hundred percent sure, really. What and it's... everybody who knows knows. Yeah, like exactly. Everybody in New York, you ask about John O'Gallagher, and they all go, "Man, that's the baddest cat on the planet." <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, uh, uh, the other quartet was happening, and 
I, you know, I, I was like, well, I, I need to do my thing. I need to create this band. And, and John and I played together a ton. So that was an obvious thing. And I was playing with Ferber in the other quartet. Mm, yeah. And I met Mark, like literally a friend of mine in LA reckoned like I, I knew um, Mike Serene was leaving the other quartet. And a friend of mine would, was like, man, this guy named Mark Ferber is moving to New York next week. You'll love him. So like, I literally met Mark his first week in New York wow. and he was instantly in the band. So, um, and then, I would, I'd been playing with Kermit in a couple of different contexts. And, and so I, I decided it was time. Um, and like many of us, you know, and this was the first thing where it was all my compositions, right? Yeah. So it was, I mean, whatever, you know, the imposter syndrome or whatever, however you want to label it, all those fears that come in as a composer are, you know, real, we all face them, you know, and I just remember playing with these guys. We did a couple of sessions and I was sweating bullets, man. Like, man, some of this stuff's too easy. Some of it's like this, some of it, you know, and I was judging everything and we started playing and I was like, oh, it's cool. <laughs> and I remember yeah. Corneli Street Cafe was like a, a pretty big venue then. And, and I used to play there a ton. And so we did our, our first gig and like a lot of cats were in the, in the audience, like a lot of the cats in, in New York were there. And people were coming up, man, I love the tunes. And I was like, really? You like my music? Oh my God. You know, because you, I had all this doubt and partly sure. because I had all these friends who are incredible composers, right? I mean, my career is mostly as a sideman playing with incredible musicians, right? So I was always holding what I was doing up writing wise up to them. And so like, that was really like uh, affirming in a way and helped me, you know, get past some things and, and I love that band, man. I love that. Yeah, band. And I would love at some point to to resurrect that. And it, yeah, it, so yeah, it, you know, it, as I said, John was the best man at my wedding, and 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 he's he's an incredible musician. And and the hookup with that band was really yeah. fantastic. But like all things, it you know, you know, um, Kermit Triscoll went um, ended up. I I had Lyme disease as well, but Kermit ended up getting Lyme disease, and it really devastated him. Yeah, and that was kind of the end. And and you know, as I said, I've always been a sideman in a lot of projects. So then it was like, oh, well, I'm doing this and I'm touring here and here and here and here. So it was like, you know, but I would, man, I would love to bring that back because, and and yeah, I, I listened to a couple of cuts off that record. Somebody played them for me. And it's, it's, it's interesting, man. I've, I've had a, several people come up to me and say, man, that record, yeah. you know, you know, and same thing with the other quartet. Like I had a, like a, a few musicians in Chicago that were like, Man, you came through on tour in 1999, and I was four, whatever, 17, 18 years old, and that was like, you know. So I guess that means I'm old, a. Eh? But it also, you know, I mean, it's it's you know, it's kind of a, you know, whatever. It's a, you know, it's a good sign, you, I think. You know, it's a good I, sign. It realizes I, that, that what you're doing has impact beyond what you think, because we're always in our own little space, yeah. our own headspace. So it's it's nice to to hear those those things. Yeah, no, no, it's, it's really. A, like th there was this platform, eMusic. Uh, I don't know if you know. Like I'm the, still a member. <laughs> really? Uh, it was like when it started. It was like twenty nine dollars for ten albums a month. Yes. This was pre streaming, and you know, I, I, I you know when you discover, I was like, okay, John O'Gallagher, that, and then you know, I bought all these records, and uh, you know, that's why I bought all the, the other quartet and Save Big and all this stuff, and I was like, man, this is killing stuff, you know, like. <laughs> And me too. And now I don't know if it ex still ex it exists actually still. It still exists, wow, and I, I still I it's you know I you know I I'm not a luddite completely, but but I uh, I uh, um, it's one of those things where I I don't let it lapse because I have so much music that was on there. It's like well if I you know cancel my subscription and because I I still like that's how I stream music because of my e music library. Wow. So, okay. When, so I'm streaming things that I've already bought, right? Yeah, yeah. I bought them through e-music. But like I have the app on my phone and when I'm driving, I'm streaming and I got my e-music plugged so cool. into my phone. Yeah. <laughs> because I, there was, I was, it's same as you, I was exposed to so much incredible music through through that. And, and that was like the first, one of the first after Napster, like the yeah. first real like kind of yeah. options. Yeah. That's so yeah. good. Yeah. No, but the, just wanted to say how I discovered Save Big and it's, sounded so fresh man and even now like i said you know like even uh, when i listen to john's music or gallagher's those mm -hmm. albums abacus and all 
it's still so modern, you know, like all this stuff you guys did, like that was done because it started this compositional approach and going into open sections and stuff. Basically, what's done also nowadays still. So in a way, and that's still how I write most yeah, of, most yeah, of the time. You know, and and you know, I talked about relying on great musicians. You rely on great musicians yeah. to, in the moment, find the way back into the composition if it wants to go there. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, I mean, you know, that area era, excuse me, that you're describing and, and your experience with e-music and stuff like that. That was a that was a huge thing for me because I was yeah. just like I was a car, you know, I was eating everything up. I was like, oh check this out, check this out. And you know, that's so that cool, was fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, that's amazing. Uh, Russ, I wanted to ask you also, like you, you mentioned uh Coltrane Stockholm and Eric Dolphy, and I know you really got involved into Dolphy. And I I, I you know, I did this solo Dolphy recording two years ago. I did like I took all of his compositions and did arrangements for acoustic guitar, and uh, that's why I'm really into Dolphy. And I thought, you know, I followed everything that was done on Dolphy. And I know you've done a lot. Like, what's your story with his music, and uh, how how did that love re-enter your life, or begin, or continue, or how, how should I put it? I was, all, I mean, I've I've been a huge fan of his music, compositionally, and his playing, and his bands, and and I mean, it's it's because I don't typically do that. Like, I recorded all of out to lunch which i yeah. never thought i would do ever so here's the story oh yeah please yeah Mer Mer merkin hall in new york city had this series i think it was like 2007 at eight i know somebody did miles on the corner where they asked artists to present a certain record so they asked me to do out to lunch mm, Dolphy's out okay. to lunch. so i was like I love that record. Of course, I'd like to do that. And it's a big, you know, it paid well, you know, do whatever. Sure. <laughs> right. It was like, it was a really big deal. So um, I transcribed the whole record and, you know, um, I didn't want to, you know, I didn't want to recreate. I mean, there's no sense in recreating a masterpiece, right? I mean, it's, and that is a masterpiece without question. Yeah. And that's think, up there. Yeah. Yeah. It's up there. Right. So it was totally, it was another one of those things where it kind of came to me to, and somebody asked me to do the project. It wasn't like a burning desire of me for me to, to, you know, cover Dolphy music, even though I love that music. Right. So um, yeah. So Merkin Hall asked me to do it and then it kind of took on a life of its own. Then, you know, mm -hmm. Juan Le Bleu in Paris asked us to come over and play. It's like, okay, cool. You know, um, I wasn't going to say no. It was, you know, uh, it's a pretty fantastic band, Myra Melford yeah, yeah. Um, on, on piano. I didn't want to use vibraphone. I didn't want to, you know, capture the exact same thing. The, the, the charts on that are my transcriptions, whether they're right or not, of the exact heads as they were played. But I didn't want to treat the solo sections the same. And I wanted to have at least one kind of wild card in there. So I didn't, you know, I, I again, I like to use personalities and I, I love Myra, I'm a huge yeah. fan of her music. So I asked her to do it. And um uh George Schuler, who was in one of your recent podcasts. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And George, you know, had access to Gunther's, you know, vast troves of of music. And uh Roy Nathanson, who again went through Curtis Folks, Roy Roy is uh, yeah. Roy was one of those people that really kind of helped along with Curtis, like that helped put me kind of on the scene in New York. Um, so, and, and Roy is a completely unique character, um, an improviser and a really yeah, unbelievably exactly. beautiful improviser. So, I mean, yeah, that kind of came out and then, and then it just, the, the project had a life of its own and, and like even the recording, I was like, man, I'm not going to record this. And then it kind of like, was like, Hey, do you want to record that? And I was like, okay. <laughs> you know? so it was it was totally a one-off thing it was a one-off one live gig where we were going to present and then it kind of had this life of its own which is a, i mean man i'm super thankful huh? and and actually um i really like the way that record turned out i think it yeah. sounds i think it it's sounds really good too and and yeah I'm, I'm i'm happy with that which like i said this goes against my core beliefs as a a composer improviser you know I, I didn't feel it like i said didn't feel a need to cover that music but um you know it was it was just this thing that kind of snowballed and, and i'm very happy that it that it did no no but you did su such a beautiful job you know but especially like you said the personalities of the band contribute so much the difference especially they contribute the difference i think that's 
that's that's better than I could have put it. They contribute the difference. That's exactly yeah, because exactly right. You know that band, the Dolph he had. It's just like come on, <laughs> it's it's crazy, right? <laughs> But, and I'm sure you know the story about the trumpet player leaving before Eddie Armour. Have you heard that story? No, no. So Eddie Armour, trumpet player, not very well known, was was um, was supposed to be on the date, and they were doing the rehearsals, and um, he got up and walked out, and he he told Dolphy, "I can't stand this music. I don't know what you're doing. Wow. I have no idea." Right? And and Eric, being you know, from all accounts the most kind loving person was like eddie if there's anything i can ever do for you please let me know on, on the way out and then freddie hubbard came in and absolutely you know helps the define the sound of that yeah. record so yeah yeah so there's there's an interesting uh, backstory to that too i know that well wow. okay that's quite cool yeah be careful, what, be careful of the gig you quit exactly yeah <laughs> exactly no but yeah super but rasa what's for this year, you know, you know, you said new records coming out, and uh, you might be coming to Europe. And this Ohat thing, I'm speaking to Ohat in two weeks, so oh, I'll, nice. I'll ask him about this record also. By the way, so. maybe I shouldn't have spoken ahead of time. Ah, no, come on. It's okay. <laughs> but uh, what, what's still on the schedule for for you for this year? I mean, and actually, um, by the time I believe this comes out, I'm leaving for Europe. Uh, in 10 days, I tour with a, a saxophonist named Cornelia Strife, Co Strife, a Swiss saxophonist. Oh, yeah. Oh, played. shit. I saw you in Cerkno, actually. <laughs> in Cerkno? Yes. In, did you, wait did wait did a we second. Hang afterwards? That, that's, uh, that, that's a story for after recording. So, with because, Gerald? With Gerald. <laughs> <laughs> man, yeah. it was, it was the long first night, man. I'll tell you later. Please. You, did Gerald tell you that afterwards? Gerald and I uh, saw the sun come up together the next okay. morning. Yeah, that explains a lot. <laughs> but you, where, where will you be in Europe? With, so uh, we're, it's mostly Switzerland, and it's with ah, okay. uh, uh, Christian Weber on bass, yeah, who's sure. amazing, and, yeah. and Jerry Hemingway on drums. Oh wow, beautiful! And yeah, so and I and and so and I think we're going to record everything. We we have a bunch of new music, and we're I think we're going to the plan is to re record everything and and release a live record with that. Oh, fantastic! Um, and I've been playing with Co on and off for a long time, two decades now. Um, and so I have that coming up. Um, the Chicago scene has been very good to me. So I'm playing down there a lot. Oh, um, and, and, you know, it's one of, one of the, you know, when I was deciding to leave New York, I mean, I just, I left New York for health insurance. <laughs> this is pre Obamacare. Um, and I had a child. So it was like, okay, I can, sure. I can, uh, yeah. you know, yeah. it, was, it was one of those life things, but it was important to me, you know, and I love teaching, man. I love teaching. Uh, but I also, it's in, incredibly important for me to play. And so Chicago has really afforded me that opportunity, oh, right? Fantastic. Like, I mean, I, I, I play eight, 10 nights a week or eight to 10 nights a month, excuse me, in, in Chicago. I'm, I'm down there every week, often two or three yeah. times a week. That's fantastic. So, and, and, you know, and I'm a part of a bunch of really great projects with a bunch of great musicians. So that, and then the new record, um, yeah, the new record I, I, I think is going to be out in the fall. Um, uh, and that's with Mark Feldman, this really great bass player, Ethan Fillion. You will have to check him out. Yeah. Um, I saw on YouTube. I, I didn't know him before, honestly. So, but, uh, man. sounds killing. Yeah. He is. And his new record's coming out on Sunnyside. Actually, we're going to be touring with that too. It's, uh, with Greg oh, Ward cool. and, um, and Dana Hall. Ooh, and I don't okay. think Dana's killing that. Sure, yeah. sure. I know. Yeah. Yeah. So that's his, yeah, his record's coming out, I think in August or September on Sunnyside, Ethan's mm -hmm. record. So I have some touring coming up with that. So I, I mean, I'm 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 busy, and yeah. and you know, and I do have a full time teaching gig, you know, and they're cool enough to let me take off for ten days to go to Europe when I need. <laughs> that's beautiful. So, yeah, yeah, it is beautiful. I'm I'm very very fortunate. So yeah, that's what's going on. Fantastic, super. Yeah. Uh, Russ, thanks for sharing some of these thoughts. Oh, it's really my really, really beautiful. You know, I won't take take more of your time. So. Uh... But I, nice. I appreciate it so much and and thank you for doing what you do because i am a fan of your of your podcast i literally i listen to it all the time um <laughs> and uh, no seriously i I, mm. I you know i i know you're at like 300 episodes i don't know if i've gotten 300 but I, yeah it's I, a I, lot I, yeah. but i but it's but it's more than 50 that's that's a lot <laughs> yeah, that's a lot I've, I've 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 listened to a lot of these so that's i appreciate lot, you yeah. having me up very much thank yeah. you yeah thanks for taking the time thank you mm -hmm.